if y'all would open in your Bible to Psalm 63. I'll turn it on now. Psalm 63. Uh, I've entitled this uh, psalm, My Soul Thirst for Thee. And you'll see why. Well, it's on the board on verse number 1. Uh, we'll read the psalm and then we'll come back and make some comments about it. David begins in verse 1 by saying, O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsteth for Thee, my flesh longeth for Thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water, to see Thy power and Thy glory, so as I have seen Thee in the sanctuary. Because Thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise Thee. Thus will I bless Thee while I live, I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and uh, my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, Thy right hand upholdeth me, for those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go down into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. You understand why we chose verse 1, my soul thirsts for thee, O God. When you think about it, David says, as someone that is in a dry and thirsty land. I've got a picture here. This is actually a picture uh, from the Judean wilderness. I didn't take it myself, so I'm going to trust the guy who made the photo that he's telling us the truth, that he was in Israel and he took a picture of this. This would be the wilderness of Judea. The wilderness where David was wandering, and we'll see the occasion of that wandering in just a moment. By the way, this is the same wilderness that Jesus went in and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. I don't know that we, in our mind, recognize what kind of landscape there is around Israel. It's a lot like the United States. There's going to be some mountainous areas, some very fruitful green areas, and yet some desert areas, some very dry land. And this is the wilderness of Judea. There are two possibilities about when this psalm was penned. The first one, and I ask you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. I know that you know the background as we look into the book of 1 Samuel. You realize that Saul has been anointed as king over Israel. You remember that he immediately disobeys God uh, by not destroying the Amalekites as God had instructed him. And then, of course, we see Saul hiding in a tent when Goliath challenges them. And then a little bit later in the book, we see Saul being very rash. Uh, they're about to go to battle. Samuel tells Saul, I'm going to go and I'm going to pray to God and I'll come back in seven days. Well, the seven days arrives. You can see uh, Saul looking at his watch. Well, Samuel's not here. Samuel's not here. And so he takes it upon himself to offer a sacrifice to God. And immediately Samuel arrives and asks Saul, what are you doing? You are not a priest. You have no authority to offer the <laughs> sacrifices that you're offering. And so from that time on, Saul is reigning illegitimately. God has dethroned him, actually dethroned him back in verse 15 when he did this with the Amalekites. God said, the kingdom, I'm going to rend it from you. So Samuel being, a, being an arrogant, prideful man, unwilling to submit to the will of God, reigns as king over Israel for perhaps 38 years. 
illegitimately. But at this point in 1 Samuel 23, the Bible tells us in verse 15 that David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Zeph in a wood. Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. You remember the close relationship between David and Saul's son, Jonathan. The Bible says they were closer than brothers. They had a very unique relationship. So Saul has come to try to kill David again. He does that repeatedly. Jonathan does not want that to happen. And so he has an allegiance to his father, but he also has an allegiance to David. So he goes to see David, strengthens him in God, and said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee. This is how uh, Jonathan is strengthening him. He's saying, God is going to take care of you. My dad is not going to slay you. He says, uh, we continue, He's not going to find me, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, and thou also saw my father Noah. Jonathan said, David, we know, even my dad knows, that you're going to be the next king. There's no doubt about it. And Jonathan said, and I will be your right hand man. Of course, we know as we get to the end of the book of Samuel that Saul and Jonathan both are killed in battle. So Jonathan doesn't get to stand by the side of David as king. But he would have if that opportunity would have arisen. So the two made a covenant, verse 18, before the Lord. David abode in the wood and Jonathan went to the house. Then came the Zephites to Saul and Gideon saying, Doth not David hide himself with us, with us in the strongholds of the wood in the hill of Hakalah, which is on the south of Jeshimon. Now therefore, O king, come now according to all thy desire of thy soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. And Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Skip down to verse 25 just for time's sake. The Bible says Saul also and his men went to seek him and they told David wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Not going to continue to read all of this, but you see the background and you see this is a possibility about when David wrote this song. There's also another possibility. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, 2 Samuel chapter 15. Now you remember that David in 2 Samuel chapter 1 had become an old man. And uh, he had not named a replacement. Because of that, there's turmoil in the kingdom. One of the sons of David uh, enthrones himself as king. There's a little bit of a battle and uh, he's driven out. So David is continuing to reign as king. And then Absalom, his son, his oldest boy, decides, I'm going to step in and I'm going to, I'm going to start reigning. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 1, it says, It came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. In verse 7, it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again into Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And of course, David said, Go. But Absalom, in verse 10, sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, When you hear the sound of the trumpet, you shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. Verse number 13, A messenger comes to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. So David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, we're in verse 14, Arise 
and let us flee, for we shall not escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring this or bring evil upon us. Again, I'm not going to read all of this. You can read this. My point is, we don't know for sure which time David is talking about when he writes Psalm 63, because in both instances, David is going through the wilderness of Judah. So I ask you to turn back to Psalm 63, and let's look at the language, and hopefully... With that background, it helps us appreciate a little bit more what David was going through. So we go again to <coughs> verse number 1. O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. Watch this. My soul thirsteth for Thee. My flesh longeth for Thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. You know, we've been through in, in East Texas uh, droughts in the past. We're, we're just now coming out of a time of drought. But uh, we haven't seen it like what they've seen in this. Well, I say we in East Texas. If you've lived in other places, if you've lived in Abilene and West, you know what it's like to look out the window and see something as dry as that. So David is talking about the wilderness of Judea and how dry it is and how as the land thirsts for water, that's the way we ought to thirst for God. My soul thirsteth for thee. Verse number 2. And again, if we're right in assuming this is one of the times when David is either fleeing from Saul or Absalom, notice then the power of verse 2 to see thy power and thy glory, watch this, as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. It tells us David is not able to go to the sanctuary. He's seen the glory of God in the sanctuary. Now he longs for that day. Brethren, I, I don't, and I really don't want to belabor, belabor this point. Do we long for the Lord's day when we can come together as His children. I don't know about y'all. When I was working out in the world, and y'all know what I mean by that. I worked in construction, so we worked around a bunch of God-fearing, <laughs> sweet men, right? No. <laughs> they were rough in the corn cob. And uh, to be with God's people on the Lord's day, it just became more and more precious. And David said just to see the power of God in His sanctuary because thy loving kindness, verse 3, is better than life. There's something better for us if we're a child of God. A life beyond this old world. No droughts, no floods, no aches, no pains, no tears, no sorrow, no dying. Isn't that a wonderful thought? And David says, because God's loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee, verse number 4, while I live. David tells us in that verse, although he doesn't say it explicitly, that our time to praise God is right now when we're alive. Not saying we won't praise God in heaven. Don't misunderstand. But, but our opportunity is now. Praise God while you have the opportunity of life. He says, I will lift up my hands in thy name. That was, of course, a, 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 an Old Testament form of prayer where the priest would raise his hands and praise God in front of the people. David said in verse 5, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. Uh, we don't see a lot of people eating the marrow anymore, but I, I can remember old timers when I was a kid breaking the bone and eating the marrow out of the bone. And, and it apparently is just chock full of all kinds of beneficial things. That's why 
broth is so good for you when you when you cook that broth and it gets all that out and it puts it into the broth. And David is saying that that I will be satisfied as if I had eaten the marrow and the fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. I noticed some didn't like that illustration, but it's true. They used to break the bones and eat the marrow out of it. Verse 6, When I remember thee in my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. Uh, can you imagine what it was like for David and that, that crowd going with him, going out into the wilderness, laying out under... You know, they didn't have light pollution like we have now. Can you imagine what the sky looked like 3,000 years ago? With no night pollution, or no light pollution, and David's laying out on his bed, looking up in the stars, meditating upon God. Verse 7, Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. I almost chose that as the title of the lesson. In the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Either one of them is an appropriate title for this psalm. David is saying, I, even though I'm fleeing in the wilderness, I still understand I am under the protective wing of God. Jesus would say it like this in Matthew chapter 23 when He's talking to the city of Jerusalem. How long would I have gathered thee together as a chicken gathers her chicks under her wing? David is saying, I'm under the wing of God. Verse number 8. My soul followeth hard after thee. I, I love that statement. You know, uh, when Jesus was being tried after He had been betrayed by Judas, the Bible tells us that the disciples deserted Jesus. But remember what it says about Peter? He followed afar off. He, he wasn't quite willing to desert Jesus, but He wasn't quite willing to get close to Him either. So He followed afar off. David said, I am following hard after my God. As close as I can get to my God. He says in verse 9, and whether he's talking about Saul or Absalom, we don't know. I would say because of this verse, I'm leaning a little bit more towards Saul because I don't think you would say this about your own son. And it's clear in 2 Samuel that we looked at a moment ago that David did not want Absalom harm. As a matter of fact, when he's killed by Joab and his men, David weeps. You remember that? Oh, Absalom, Absalom. My son, Absalom. He wept over that son. But in this, he says, those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They're going to die and be buried. And then he makes this statement, they shall fall by the sword. I don't know that I can prove this, but I think Jesus may have been leaning toward this psalm when He said in Matthew 26 and verse 52, those that live by the sword are going to die by the sword. I think that's what David is saying in this psalm. I think Jesus is taking this psalm and making application. If you live by the sword, if you hate the people of God, you will fall by the sword. And they shall have a portion for the foxes. The word foxes there can be translated as jackals. Uh, even though foxes, and y'all know this if you've got any foxes around, you put out some meat and those foxes are going to chew it down and, and it'll be gone. Uh, we've got a family of foxes that live out. We had a ham that went bad and we threw it outside and I got some great pictures of the foxes coming up because they, they were going after it. And he's saying to these people that are against God, your body, you will die in the wilderness and the jackals and the foxes and the coyotes, we would say, will eat your meat down to the bone. That's what's in store for those that violate the will of God. Verse number 11. Notice the contrast. But the king, and I think he's talking of himself, 
shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by Him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. It's a glorious psalm. We may not know exactly when David penned it, but it really doesn't matter. In times of trouble, we appeal to God. Just as the land that is dry and thirsty longs for the rain, the soul of God's people long for Him. So this afternoon, I hope this song will make us consider a little bit about where we are. I hope your soul is thirsting after God. And if you're not a Christian, as we always do, we remind you of God's plan of salvation. We just quote Jesus. Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. If you've never been obedient to the Gospel, we plead with you to respond. As a child of God, if you have a need, please come as we stand and as we sing.